I want to thank all of you for coming out uh, and joining us today. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to be here and uh, to uh, acquaint you with some of New Era's big ideas. Um, you know, it sounds a bit self-serving, but when you consider uh, the technology behind the control editor and image focus and their impact that they have on easing the overall mainframe uh, administration, uh, I, I think it's well served. Uh, but today we're going to talk about modernization uh, and visualization. Now, forever, uh, we've all been using TSO as our primary interface uh, to the ZOS environment. Uh, it served us well. Uh, I've been using it at least for 35 years. And uh, I have to tell you, uh, I find it very familiar, easy to use, uh, highly functional. And uh, I have a hard time finding any faults with it uh, other than just obvious things that I've gotten used to over time. But time moves on and new people come on board and new technology takes over. And so IBM introduced us about 10 years ago to ZOSML. And today uh, it's essentially a staple. It's something that you have to have in order to be able to essentially move forward with the IPL of the ZOS environment. Uh, some people like it, some people don't, uh, they resist it. Uh, typically those people are those that are having to make the transition from TSO to ZOSMF and uh, sometimes wonder why they're being uh, forced to do so. Uh, but it's a way of life. It's the way things are going and that trend uh, is going to continue. Uh, we support that uh, with a new offering from New Era we refer to as ICE Direct. Uh, it provides uh, a visual interface uh, to uh, the control editor and image focus that we hope uh, will attract uh, all users, uh, but I have to admit is oriented towards um, the next generation, those people who are coming on board who need to get familiar with the OS and perhaps uh, would like a different form of interface that uh, would give them an opportunity to explore and visualize the ZOS environment differently from the way in which we've seen it classically. Now, one of the things that you're going to see immediately when we get into a demonstration of ICE Direct uh, is that it's highly visual. Uh, it uses lots of icons to represent uh, functionality and findings. And their primary intention is to uh, draw you in, uh, to encourage uh, your exploration, uh, to uh, give you the opportunity to drill down into the detail uh, easily um, and find out uh, what's going on inside of the findings, uh, not only from an inspection, but also from uh, those records which are recorded uh, in our control journal from uh, excuse me, the control editor. One of the features that uh, I like about ICE Direct uh, is its interface to uh, uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, in uh, our case, we represent that with an icon called AS, which stands for Assisted Skills. And we use uh, ChatGPT, but other uh, interfaces uh, and other um, AI models uh, can be integrated uh, as well. And those uh, give additional opportunity for understanding and exploration uh, beyond those uh, capabilities, which are found in uh, either image focus or the control editor. And so we're really uh, highly encouraged by that, uh, and we think it will expand over time, uh, and we encourage you to become familiar with it as well. So let's get started. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, ICE Direct interfaces directly into uh, ZOSMF. Uh, that's uh, kind of an important thing, we believe, because what it allows ICE Direct to do uh, is to uh, benefit. I'm going to change my view here. From, I'm going to go to the classic view because I tend to like it better. I'm kind of a classic guy. Uh, it, it, it allows us to uh, benefit from all the security that you've set up around ZOSMF. 
And so not only logging on to and the requirements for that for ZOSMF, but also the security that can revolve around the basic links themselves, uh, which link the applications directly into the ZOSMF uh, menus. And as you can see on the left-hand side, we have uh, three different uh, ICE Direct uh, links. Uh, th this is to indicate that uh, these ICE Directs can be on various remote systems around the world. Uh, so they don't have to be on the local system, they can be on a remote system, uh, and, uh, and you can gain access to uh, the control editor and image focus, uh, whether you're in New York or in somewhere in uh, Barcelona, Spain, or perhaps in Hong Kong, as the case may be. Now, mine's uh, it, located in Los Angeles. I'm in the San Francisco area, but this ICE Direct is being housed uh, on a server uh, in Los Angeles. So I'll go ahead and click on it. And the first thing it does is it opens up another window that requires me to log on. And that's obviously critical because I'm logging on to a ZOS system. So the first point about ICE Direct is that the web server that supports it uh, is integrated into uh, the image focus deliverable. So there isn't any need uh, to stand up a copy of Liberty or uh, Tomcat or uh, any other uh, web server, independent web server environment. Uh, it simply comes along with the image focus uh, download and uh, setting it up is relatively easy and our technical support group would be more than happy to uh, get you going in that regard. So I'll go ahead and log on. Paul, while you're doing so, uh, uh -huh. let me double let me double check with Andrew or, or Sammy. Do you have Paul's proper screen on? Do you see the log on screen? I, I hope so. No, it um it looks like it's the one from the presentation. Yes, I see presentation log on. Oh, okay. All right. Let me uh let me get out of that and uh excuse me just a minute. Sorry about that, folks. I was supposed to have a seamless integration here, but apparently I don't. Thanks, Glenn. Mm-hmm. Go ahead and log on here. It'll take just a second. Thank you for your patience. Okay, how does that work? Is that better? You got it. We got it now. Thank you. We got the ICE Direct main menu up. All right, thank you. Let me just expand this out a little bit. All right, well, with that little interruption, uh, we're now in the ICE Direct uh, primary menu. Uh, again, we came in through ZOSMF. Uh, we logged on to a remote server, in my case, down in Los Angeles. Uh, the server itself is mainframe based and it comes along as part of the image focus download, which we can help you to get it up and active very quickly. Uh, there are three elements to the interface itself, uh, the components that you would become familiar with. Uh, the upper part is called the request frame. Uh, the lower part is called the results frame. And on the left-hand side, in what we call the sidebar, we have all of the various applications uh, that are accessible uh, directly from the primary menu. Now, the additional uh, charge for this is an upcharge in uh, maintenance and support. Uh, and I think you would find that minimal. Uh, but there's a substantial amount of functionality that comes along with it. There are some added uh, applications uh, that we refer to as being available on the visual application stack. 
And uh, I'll spend some time on one of those that we call certificate intelligence. So just to give you an idea of how this works, um, if I click on my who, uh, the first thing it's gonna do is it's gonna come back and it's gonna tell me uh, what level of privilege uh, that I have uh, as a user. So right now I'm logged on as a TCE Prime Administrator and uh, I am also uh, an MFE Auditor. So this pretty much parallels uh, the kind of authority and functionality you would find uh, in RACF or ACF2. Uh, someone with special, someone who's an auditor, uh, either one or both uh, may be uh, uh, assigned to a specific individual uh, for their access. And then we could ask the question, what can I do? And it would come back and say, of the four basic functions that are in uh, ICE Direct, uh, working with the various reports, performing analytics, modifying controls and structures, uh, and elements of security, uh, as the current uh, permissions, which I have, I'm able to do all four of those. So, so a lot of activities can be resolved quickly for individual users by just allowing them uh, access, but whatever access they're allowed, they can figure out what their functionality uh, capability really is. Uh, I can look at my history uh, over time because the control editor and the control journal uh, which records activity when you're in the integrity controlled environment is following me and keeping track of what I've been doing. So since uh, September 29th, uh, what kind of activity have I had? I can get a report or I can get a donut chart and I chose a donut here in this case. And I've had uh, 146 different events uh, 44 of them are audit related. This has to do with uh, activities I've had to uh, change the settings on various uh, detectors, which are uh, automated uh, monitors, which run synchronously uh, and in some cases asynchronously and send emails about various uh, uh, findings uh, in the integrity controls environment. Uh, or uh, activities that have to do with, uh, with changes of various uh, components. So uh, in this case, uh, uh, in two members, one, uh, uh, excuse me, one member uh, that I changed twice on, uh, at various times on the 29th. Uh, and if I wanna see the details of that, uh, then I can just click on that one So I generally think by now you get the idea. Uh, I select something, I decide uh, what kind of results I'm looking for. Uh, I find those results, I drill down further, uh, and I just keep, I just keep moving on. Uh, I can modify uh, the pins that I might use for multi-factor authentication because ISHREC does support that. Uh, and so as an individual user, I could change those pins and I could do that right now. I can also modify uh, the codes that I use and the methods that I receive delivery of tokens to access uh, secured components uh, in the integrity controls environment uh, using the techniques that are often explained by uh, my colleague Glenn Bagsby in his presentations on zero trust. So I can put my old pin in, put my new one, confirm it, and uh, I'm away I go. So, so the individual controls that we would normally find uh, being accessed and changed in a 3270 environment that relate to uh, the integrity controls environment, uh, we can make all of those equivalent changes here uh, in ICE Direct. But to get more to the point, uh, one of the things I mentioned at the beginning is our interface to uh, artificial intelligence. So I'll click on AS, and it'll bring up a screen that says, hey, what, what, what is it that you would like to do? Would you like to query uh, a personal chat, uh, or would you like to query uh, and create a group chat that could be shared with, uh, with other individuals in your organization? Uh, so we're going to do a private chat, and we're just going to ask it the question, uh, what is secure boot? 
and it'll come back and it'll say, okay, well, let's validate that. And uh, as you do that, you could update your uh, log of chats that are private to you, or you would potentially update the log of group chats that you want to share with other individuals in your organization. When I click on uh, send a request to the bot, uh, it opens up uh, what we call a modal or the industry would call a modal. Uh, this modal is running independent of the server uh, strictly on the laptop uh, or computer that we happen to be accessing uh, uh, iSelect on uh, so that it's totally insulated from the, the mainframe environment itself. So you can see the level of answer that we have uh, are these chats uh, perfect? No, they're not. Uh, can the chatbots uh, hallucinate in some cases? Yes, they can. Uh, but as you continue to use this over time, it gets smarter and smarter. And so I think that uh, if we come back to this in six months or a year, uh, we're going to find this interface very helpful for those who are interested in asking questions about things that maybe they would normally ask their mentor, uh, but now they have a chat bot that they can speak to, uh, or they might use this information for actually uh, creating replies uh, or reports uh, that uh, are requested by their boss. Uh, we can keep all the chats, as I mentioned. So we updated that. We can display the log. So now what is secure boot uh, is now a permanent record in our uh, log of chats that we've made on a personal basis. Uh, and then we can refer to any of these um, as we go forward. So here's some more complicated ones. Can PKI services help me with uh, multi-SAN certificates? And the answer comes back and says, yes, it can do that. Uh, just uh, question after question after question. Uh, they can be deleted at any time that we like. And uh, as I mentioned, you can also have a group chat and the group chat could be uh, positioned in such a way that uh, one person, maybe uh, a supervisor or a boss uh, or uh, another individual in your group uh, maintains the chats that the group uh, would be asked to pay attention to. And so perhaps reviewing those chats once a week or once a month uh, would become helpful to uh, onboarding uh, new individuals into the organization. All right. So I opened up a new window uh, when I did that and uh, I'll go ahead and close this. So now I'm back to where I was originally. Oops, where'd I go? Excuse me. Okay. See if I can get zoom out of the way here. Not really. All right. So let's get down to business here. Uh, a lot of individuals would use uh, image focus uh, in a batch environment. And one of the batch applications we have is referred to as Ice Bat A. And so I'm going to go ahead and click on the application that's called My Bat. And uh, we'll bring up a request panel, uh, and uh, it allows me to go directly uh, to an inspection log. All the uh, batch inspections are directed to specific logs. Um, this one happens to be uh, automatically determined uh, from the system that I happen to be residing on, uh, but I can also uh, specify uh, an alternative uh, log data set, perhaps on uh, a log from another system that, uh, that I might be interested in. Or I can set up a worksheet of logs, in this case, 18 of them, uh, and, uh, and submit a request. Now, an inspection log, if you're familiar with this, uh, will run anywhere from 15 to 20,000 records in length, depending on the complexity of the ZOS environment that's being inspected. 
So um, delineating all of that, analyzing all of that takes a few seconds. So we did all 18 of those in 14, uh, 20 seconds. You can see our little uh, performance meter down in the left-hand corner here tells us how much time was spent in ICE and how much time was spent uh, in TCP IP uh, as a percentage of the overall time. Uh, all the colorations is designed to um, present uh, an understanding of the state and status of the logs themselves. The ones that are in orange are old. You can see the dates here. This one's greater than 99 days. Uh, the green ones are less than 30 days. Uh, and the one at the very bottom uh, happens to be brand new. So as things change over time uh, and you have an opportunity to come in and query against the worksheet that you have created because you will put in all of these values, uh, these log data set names, uh, you can instantly tell which ones are new, which ones are getting old, which ones need to be run again, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what can we do here? Well, the first thing we might want to do is take a look at the configuration uh, and uh, what findings we've made because it tells us that there are some errors in this particular log. So we'll click on those little gears. And what we get back uh, is a report uh, that lists all of the members that are all found along the IPL path uh, by category. So those that are NIPS process related uh, members, those that were defined in IEA SIS, and then the green ones are subsystems that were started along the way. And we can see the various results uh, on the left-hand side, uh, the little green uh, indicator indicates that there's no particular problem. Uh, the little red one indicates that, uh, that there's something wrong. That's where the errors have been found and uh, perhaps we should take a look and do something about that. If I click on this little red indicator next to the member name PROGCM, it'll take me directly into the inspection report and show me uh, the member, but also all of the issues that are associated with that particular member. And uh, uh, in this particular case, in this particular system, this is development system, uh, these um, issues of integrity, that is that the APF data sets have not been uh, uh, defined correctly or they haven't been uh, uh, secured, protect, uh, secured and protected correctly, uh, essentially is a function of development and not a production type system. If you found this in a production system, uh, it would be, uh, I think it would, you'd find it tragic. Uh, but you can also see that uh, assisted skills is popping up along the way. And uh, if we click on these, uh, iSdirect will actually uh, focus on that particular message and send it to the chat bot and have it come back with an answer uh, that will give us some direction as to what it is we might do in order to resolve that particular problem. So we can, I sort of think of this as a super form of help uh, that uh, is flexible enough uh, to address each of the individual uh, findings uh, that come from the ZOS and, uh, image focus inspection again, essentially to help with uh, a user's understanding of, uh, of what the problem uh, really turns out to be. This particular system is hooked to the control editor as well. So I can click on this uh, function up here called members in uh, the journal history. Uh, and it will come back again with a chart uh, that details all of the members that are in the control journal uh, that have uh, the member name of PROGCM. Now, you might say, well, why are there so many of those? And the reason is, is because they're in different data sets and perhaps in different volumes. So you can see the listing down below 
of all of the individual uh, components that are here or members that are here and where they actually reside. Uh, clicking on one of these. Again, we're drilling down, we're exploring, we're investigating. We're doing it just by clicking. Uh, gives us a list of the two members. Uh, the blue one represents a backup uh, and always will in these particular reports. Uh, and then the green one represents uh, an activity that has taken place uh, since that original backup was taken. Uh, we can click on that. And again, we're just drilling down uh, into the actual member itself uh, for it to come back and tell us uh, exactly what the change is that, uh, that it's reporting. So since that backup was taken, there's been an entry uh, that uh, was uh, uh, intended uh, to add an APF data set uh, to the APF list uh, through this particular member, and you can see that there. Okay. And uh, this data up here at the top tells us when that took place, who did it, what system they were on, and obviously uh, what... Uh, uh, control data set and volume uh, this is associated with. So again, drilling down into the detail to find out exactly what this report is trying to tell us relative to uh, uh, the finding that it made uh, from here. Now, this is the IPL path. This is the exact way in which image focus took the unit address and load parm and said okay i'm going to perform a virtual ipl i'm going to collect that information member by member and then i'm going to display it this way but you can also display it another way there is a function up here that's called show ipl path sorted by last update well if i click on that We'll resource that list and we'll put the member that was last changed up at the top of the list. So now it's sorted by date. So we can see in this particular configuration, the last member that was actually changed is the one that's up at the very top here. So it's the IKJTSO member. Here's the data set that it's in. Here's the volume it's on. Here's when it was changed, the time, and who actually is responsible for changing it. Uh, P. Harlow, too, is someone you're likely familiar with, Pat Harlow. He's our director of technical support. So again, a different way of slicing the data, a different way of visualizing the data, another way to uh, explore it, and hopefully to encourage investigation uh, of the findings themselves. All right, so we'll go back. So, so here we are now, we're looking at our panel again, and there are other reports inside the inspection report that sometimes go overlooked. Uh, one of them is a report on dynamic changes, that is changes that have taken place to the configuration since it was IPL that uh, were made uh, quite likely via line commands of one kind or another. And so if we, we see that there is a difference in this report because uh, it shows difference as highlighted, and we'll click on that. And so what it's doing again is, is examining that inspection report that's associated uh, with that batch job. And it's looking for dynamic changes in the dynamic change report. And it comes back and it says, yes, I found some changes. Uh, there is a difference uh, in the LPA list. There is something that has changed there. So you can see we have a number of different uh, categories of information, the APF list, the BPX list, uh, BPX mount, uh, uh, link list, LPA list, of course, and then, of course, the symbols list. So all of those are being examined. And so as we get down here, 
we can see highlighted that there's been some dynamic changes in the LPA list. And we can see what those changes have been uh, down below. Uh, there's been the addition of a couple of modules. There's been the deletion of four modules, and, and, that, uh, the, and that represents uh, the changes that are being reported. And if we expected to see those, fine. If we're not expecting to see them, uh, then a further investigation uh, might be necessary. Again, clicking on assisted skills will bring us to an understanding, hopefully, of uh, actually what happened there. How was those changes made? How did we gather this information? What should we do next? Uh, we could display the LPA list uh, if we chose to through a line command uh, in a 3270 environment. So again, more explanation, more opportunity to learn, more opportunity to more quickly onboard uh, that next generation of uh, ZOS system programmers. Uh, going back. Now, other things that we can do here is we can set up baselines uh, and we can uh, compare them. And so if we set up a baseline, we would do that by creating a snapshot. And then we can compare the snapshot against the current configuration uh, to determine uh, what changes, if any, uh, we might be finding. So if I now click on uh, check for configuration changes, then I can see all the changes that have taken place between when I set up my baseline. Remember, this is a very personal system. And so the changes that we're looking at here relate to you as an individual saying, I want to track that. And so you click the button, you took a snapshot, and now as you move forward in time, until you take another snapshot, every time you come in, you'll be able to see whether or not there are any particular changes or not. And uh, you might say, uh, well, that, uh, that might be uh, a bit cumbersome because uh, I have 18 different images here that I'm looking at. Uh, is there some way I could check them all at once? And there is, you can compare all the snapshots at one time uh, if you choose to do it. On a more localized basis, uh, for each individual uh, inspection report uh, that, uh, that comes through the environment and gets displayed here, there will be a comparison of the inspection findings in this report against another baseline that you can take, which we call a checkpoint. And that checkpoint is different from a configuration snapshot in that the checkpoint deals solely with uh, inspection results. And if there is a change in the inspection results from one to the next, then the little checkpoint crossbar here will be down. And so if I click on that, it'll come back and it'll tell me, all right, the way it was is shown over here on the right-hand side. So this is a side-by-side -side compare. Uh, this is the way uh, the inspection results appeared when I took my checkpoint. And this is the way it appears now. And you can see the primary difference uh, between the two are inspection messages which are coming out that are related to uh, Secure Boot, uh, a new functionality which is now incorporated uh, into Image Focus. For those of you that are planning to or contemplating uh, Secure Boot, there are now options in Image Focus that allow you to check. Uh, the configuration and setup of the configure of the secure boot process in order to avoid uh, any future uh, audit uh, reports uh, or any uh, IPL failures in, uh, in the attempt that you might uh, in the, in the effort to IPL a system under secure boot uh, where you've decided to uh, allow the system to fail if it finds a problem so. So this is a really good thing for you as you move forward with Secure Boot. We'll come back to the Secure Boot issue here in just a minute. There's another function down here 
that I want to show you as well. Uh, let me uncheck a few of these. It's called Insight. And Insight deals, again, not with configuration changes, but it deals with uh, inspection findings. So if I click on uh, Show LPAR Insights, It goes off and analyzes that report, of course, and it comes back with a stacked bar chart and says, hey, listen, in that image, which is ZG31, you can see it highlighted up at the top, uh, there are really uh, two messages that are of significance here. Uh, one is a notice and the other one is an informational message. And uh, in the report, uh, there are two of those messages that uh, are notices, and then there is nine of them, which are uh, informational messages. And so we can click on those and explore them and, and uh, drill down into the detail. But perhaps more importantly, would be a situation where we actually take a report and we uh, create what is often called uh, a, a, a uh, drift uh, baseline. Uh, and uh, again, uh, we have a, uh, a snapshot, uh, we have a checkpoint. Uh, now we're introducing a baseline. I mean, Jesus, we've got so many places where we can station uh, uh, componentry uh, and use them, those stations as models for uh, detecting uh, changes, and in this case, what we refer to as drift, uh, from them uh, over time. So we have one. Uh, let's go ahead and see how it compares out. So now we can compare up to seven additional ones uh, against uh, that baseline. So now we're reading eight different inspection reports. We're analyzing all of their uh, findings. Uh, we're comparing them one against the other, uh, and we're producing a chart, again, a set of stacked bar charts, uh, for each of the images that were selected uh, so that we can, in fact, compare them against, uh, against the standard. Now, the standard uh, might be the first one here, uh, TFO2, and you can see uh, they, they all essentially uh, match the standard. Uh, but uh, four of them have an additional warning uh, that uh, is likely uh, to require some investigation. Uh, one of them doesn't have that warning, but it has an error message in it. So that's probably something that we want to go ahead and investigate. And we can click on that. And it'll take us into a report where we can see what those warnings are. And uh, this is likely the one that's being reported. It's a JES message. <clears throat> and we can see this one on the right-hand side. It's totally out of control. We're not sure what happened to it, uh, but it's got it's, got its own set of, uh, of specific problems. And so th the idea of drift analysis is that you, you create a standard, a baseline, uh, that says, okay, this is an image, we inspected it, here's a couple of things that are in it, we accept those, uh, let's go forward in time because we have essentially modeled all the other images off of this one, and so we don't expect them uh, to deviate one from the other as we move forward. But as we move forward, deviations begin to appear, and, uh, and it's important uh, that we begin to investigate them. Other things that we would find in an inspection report, which often don't pop to the top, uh, are what we refer to as uh, audit reports. Now, our audit reports are prepared in conformity with generally accepted security practices. That is, these are things that auditors uh, would normally be interested in paying some attention to. And you can see we have 20 or so of those. Uh, ranging from everything like the program property table. I'll go ahead and display that. And by the way, it, partitioning people off uh, inside of the ICE Direct environment uh, 
possibly would give your auditors access to this information and perhaps general users no access to this information. It just depends on how you want to uh, set things up. So this is, uh, this is a somewhat complex table. Uh, it involves uh, three different members uh, that were found along the inspection path. Uh, the SCED00 member, of course, is a default member. SCEDZW is another. Uh, and then IEFSGPPG uh, is the IBM uh, program property table member. And you can see some of the coloration here trying to call attention uh, to various things that we found. Uh, uh, no configuration defined um, uh, for uh, pass, no pass uh, on a couple of the members. Uh, one actually defined as no pass, which is not considered a good thing, uh, indicates nonconformity. Uh, it might be worthwhile investigating. Uh, a number of no pass uh, uh, settings uh, in the IBM program property table. Um, they are highlighted in green because uh, it indicates that, uh, okay, well, this is something IBM's doing. Uh, maybe it's okay. Maybe if you've got a question about it, you ought to ask IBM. They might be able to explain it uh, more completely. So you can see that indicates an IBM default. Uh, you can, if you want to, you can uh, create reports from these. Uh, you can see the report on the left-hand side. We can reduce this uh, to a PGF, a PDF, excuse me, and uh, print it out, uh, give it to our auditors, and, uh, and I should, everybody should be happy uh, that we've been able to provide them with... Uh, a complete audit of the program property table. So I'll go ahead and cancel this. I'll open it in preview. So this is what the report would look like as a PDF. Okay, so let me back up here. I've got one more I want to show you. Uh, this is something uh, relatively new. This is the Secure Boot uh, Checklist. This is a new report that is uh, based on the Secure Boot report, which is created uh, by Image Focus. Again, we're discovering the report uh, from the inspection log that we selected in that first panel. Uh, the report is basically broken down into two sections. Uh, the secure boot volume library and module uh, operational stack. So this is the stack of components that are being used in uh, a secure boot. And we can see the results of that uh, inspection. Uh, we're not set up for secure boot. We're on a ZPDT, so uh, we can't really perform uh, a, uh, uh, a secure boot at this particular point in time. We do test on a full machine, but I'm on a ZPDT. Uh, we can see the uh, members uh, that, uh, that are being called uh, to, uh, or excuse me, the data sets that are being called and the first eight members uh, in those data sets that failed uh, the uh, inspection process itself for secure boot. We can see the volumes that were being called as part of the secure boot process. And we can see the individual members in various of the data sets that are called independently for uh, FLPA, MLPA, and, and GLPA. The second part of the report uh, shows the validation of the primary elements that are used in secure boot, both the volumes and the data sets. And you can see there are four different volumes that are actually being used in the secure boot process as defined above. So we 
delimited the list to just the unique ones. And we found that two of them had actually signed IPL tax. And so we pulled out uh, the subject key ID uh, for each of those. Uh, we related that subject key ID to certificates that are in the RACF data store. And you can see there's two separate certificates. Now, normally there would only be one volume that would be signed, uh, and that would be the SysRes volume. But other volumes can have uh, IPL text on it, and they can be signed as well without interfering uh, in the secure boot process itself. Uh, the Z boot loader is going to evaluate this one for its IPL text. Uh, this one has IPL text, but it's not going to be evaluated by the Z boot loader, but I just have it here for demonstration. I can click on the, <clears throat> excuse me, the certificate label and display the certificate. And we use two methods of display. Uh, one of them is proprietary to uh, New Era, which we call Certificate Intelligence. And the other one uh, is a standard rack desert list command uh, output, which you see on the right-hand side. Uh, there are a number of different uh, advantages to what you see on the left, additional information that's being pulled out of, of RACF. One of them is the subject key identifier itself. Uh, RACF doesn't, that it contains that information, but it doesn't provide it uh, in its list command. Another one which is critically important uh, is when was the certificate installed and, and uh, who installed it? Uh, this can become critical uh, at a point in time when you're attempting to renew a certificate that might be approaching uh, end of life. And there are others not necessarily displayable in this particular certificate, uh, but that deal with um, uh, alternate subject names. So here's uh, where those would appear. Uh, RACF will only list uh, four of them, uh, the, the four independent variables, um, uh, the uh, DNS, email, uh, URL, and uh, URI uh, components. Uh, Certificate Intelligence will list them all, uh, if you have 100 of them, it will list all of those as well. Uh, RACF uh, contains that information, but again, the list command doesn't show it. They say they're going to improve that uh, sometime in the future, so we're waiting for that uh, to occur. Uh, the same thing is true when we look at the individual uh, libraries that were signed. Uh, these are uh, individual libraries uh, that are uh, part of the uh, secure boot process. Uh, so the Nucleus, uh, some LPA libraries, you can see we report on those that are don't have members, we report on those that are not signed. But if it is signed, then we will extract the key ring uh, from the signed uh, library or from a module, and we will then link it uh, to a specific certificate. That is the one that was used in the signing itself. And you'll notice that uh, in here, uh, we're pointing out uh, expiration dates uh, and we're pointing out when uh, they were signed and who signed them. So, uh, so lots of additional information in here. Uh, this was approaching uh, a, <clears throat> excuse me, an expiration which is within 30 days, there would be a warning here that would say, hey, you better probably pay attention to this because if this expires, you will not necessarily have uh, a problem in the secure boot process, but you will have a problem in signing additional resources using that specific certificate. So lots of good stuff here uh, in those audit reports. So this, uh, this essentially uh, goes on and on, uh, just continuously exploring, continuously looking for things, continuously drilling down, just point and shoot uh, to get uh, to whatever additional information uh, you're interested in. But let me show you one other thing before we go. Uh, this is an additional charge set of applications. There are five of them. 
uh, ZOS visual. This deals with lots of different specific functions and access to lots of ZOS stuff. Uh, RACF visual, this is an interface to uh, the RACF data store for things like profiles and permits, uh, uh, doing analysis and audits of different users and uh, data sets, et cetera. ICSF visual, this is an exploration of the ICSF data store, both uh, CKDS and PKDS and uh, et cetera. Uh, certificate visual, we're going to go into that in just a minute, and, uh, and uh, client assist. Uh, this is an interesting function that allows you to check uh, for the SSL uh, connectability of a specific uh, key ring uh, to a remote uh, server. If we go to um, cert visual, We're going to populate the request panel uh, with a uh, query facility that allows us to query um, both uh, in entity certificates, sometimes called ID user certificates, and uh, cert auth or site certificates. And I'm going to start off with something uh, relatively simple. I'm just going to ask it uh, could you please just list? Uh, all of the personal certificates that are currently in the RACF data store. So it's going to go off and uh, it's going to find all the ID or personal certificates or in entity certificates, however you describe that, uh, and give us a list of them. Now, while it's creating that list, what it's doing is it's analyzing each one of them for characteristics about whether it contains a private key, where the private key is stored, uh, whether or not it, it, we know its usage, uh, if it's connected uh, to a key ring, uh, it, just on and on. But importantly, it's telling us whether it's trusted or not. So TNN over here, who owns it? Okay, so the user ID, the name of the label that's associated with that certificate. And since this is sorted, uh, with uh, the uh, method of having uh, the one that's going to expire last shown up at the top. So this one will expire in uh, December of 2050. And then starting uh, notification of those that are going to expire uh, in the next 30 days uh, in red here. And then those that are already expired in this sort of salmon color. And if we wanted to, when we found one that was expired, because there's little that we can do with it, and in this particular case, uh, the key uh, for this certificate was actually stored in ICSF, but for whatever reason, uh, it's also been deleted. So this certificate is really uh, useless at this point. We can go ahead and delete it just by clicking on the trash can. And we'll get a panel that allows us to confirm what the delete command looks like as best as required by RACD cert. If we confirm it by clicking this button, then it will be deleted. Uh, the appropriate uh, uh, res uh, reset will be uh, created, refresh will be created, uh, and then we'll be back to uh, our original panel. Um, there is just a whole bunch of stuff here that um, if we select a certificate, if we can find one that relates to us, here it is. So this is the ICE Direct server. This is the actual certificate that is protecting uh, the server uh, that we are attached to uh, in Los Angeles. And uh, you can see up at the very top, it's saying, yes, there's a private key. Um, there is uh, the type of the certificate, the length of the uh, key, uh, the strength of it, whether it's stored in ICSF, in this case it's not, whether it's trusted, when will it expire in 364 days? We had to update it for today because it had, would have expired today. Uh, what are we using it for, for authorization, who owns it, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if we click on start one, we can go directly uh, into the key ring uh, that is the 
uh, housing of that particular certificate and find all the root and intermediate certificates that support it as well. And of course, clicking on any of those certificates will allow us to drill down into them uh, individually. Okay. So again, exploring, drilling down, and in many cases, uh, not necessarily uh, in this case, but in many cases, not reaching the end of that process, simply uh, feeding your imagination and your curiosity so that, uh, that you can uh, proceed to uh, whatever point uh, you believe is necessary. Let's see if I can find one other one here. That might be interesting. Hmm. Yeah, maybe. I don't think so. Anyway, you can just get them all. So this is a nice, uh, this is a nice facility. Uh, this is the list of all of them, but uh, we're we're essentially not interested in all of them. We're interested only uh, in those that are owned by a specific individual. So. Uh, Charles Mills, uh, my good friend who helped uh, in the background uh, on many of the functions that you see here in certificates. We want to see what certificates he has. And it comes back and it says these are the ones that Charles has. And we can see which ones of them are expired, which ones of them are not. We can, we can just drill down to our heart's content. Uh, a question that's also asked uh, quite frequently. I think I got that right. We'll find out. These are the ones that are going to expire in 30 days. Okay, so, so we can proactively uh, query the system to see uh, what uh, issues uh, from an expiration perspective might be out there that uh, that might tend to uh, cause us uh, uh, or potentially cause us some difficulty by just saying, okay, we're expiring that. Or we can find a specific certificate. I want a personal in-user, in-entity certificate that contains in its label, ICE Direct. And it goes out and it finds that particular certificate, gives us the detail on it and allows us to drill down accordingly. So the, the, the general idea again uh, is to uh, put you, excuse me, let me share my screen again, put you in a position uh, to be able to not only get to the functionality that uh, is created in image focus in the control editor, but to expand your ability to uh, explore and investigate, uh, even to the extent that there is an interface to uh, a chatbot, um, in our case, ChatGPT, but it could be uh, any other uh, bot that you might choose. Uh, so you're faced now with essentially a choice uh, of what it is you want to do and how it is you want to use uh, the new era products. You can stay with the integrity controls environment as you know it uh, in a 3270 environment, or you can uh, alternately uh, and simultaneously uh, fire up the web server, which is relatively easy to do. Again, you don't have to stand up an independent web server, it comes as part of the image focus download uh, and uh, explore and begin to investigate uh, in more detail uh, the findings in the various uh, inspection reports and journals. And then over time, expand your usage uh, into other applications like certificate intelligence. If you're concerned about uh, the cost of the chatbots, uh, just know that in the case of ChatGPT in the month of August, for example, 
uh, where usage was particularly high, uh, the overall bill that we got was less than 10 cents. Uh, the cost of a single chat uh, is measured in micro pennies by their terminology. And uh, uh, you could chat quite a bit before you could run up uh, a dollar's worth of cost in any given month. So, so it's very inexpensive and uh, I think it's very highly useful. So uh, what is iceDirect? Um, it's a web-based application uh, that allows us to express our big ideas about the content of uh, image focus uh, and the control editor. Uh, thank you for attending. I really appreciate your time and attention. And if you have any uh, additional questions or need any additional uh, support, uh, please email either Andrew or Sammy at support at newera.com and uh, they'll be glad to assist you.